Hand me that soda over there, the Coke. The, yeah, the full one. Yeah, that soda. Give it the other three. Yeah. Shouldn't get any kind of like fork cur infections or anything, so. <laughs> you brought your son? This is going to end interestingly. Yeah. Good evening. Welcome to our strange little madhouse again. This has by far been the busiest month that we've had. Thank you all for coming out yet again. We do appreciate it. Um, we were going back and forth about trying to figure out whether or not we were scheduled for next uh, Monday. And we realized that with Memorial Day and everything else that will be put off, but we will be going to two shows here, uh, two shows a month here starting in June. So. One show will be your standard Samurai of Spoken Word, and the other one will be what we've come to refer to as the Samurai of Spoken Word Underground. You will find out what that means eventually, really whether you want to or not. <laughs> because we will make videos and we will send them to you. Yeah. And we have a Ludvico technique machine for those of you who would say you don't want to watch them. Oh, Dave, Randy from Vivid called back just to let you know you've heard your call. Oh, sweet, excellent. I love that. It's always cool, it's always cool when the porn stars remember you. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually going to be the story that I'm going to tell on Sunday, but we'll get to that later. Um, I would like to point out for those of you who decide that you really like us or who already know us, or for those of you who decide that you really feel the need for some kind of emotional torture, we'll be doing another show on Sunday about up the block in a place called Papa Chris's. So come on down, enjoy our brand new venue, and help to improve, you know, show to them that we do actually have something kind of like an audience. And so to begin the show, I'm going to introduce you to our MC, who will then be immediately introducing me again, because we love redundancy in our shows, damn it. Yeah. Uh, he's a, well, I like to think of him as a writer, but he prefers to think of himself as a professional troll. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Will Ross. Ladies and gentlemen, Bizarro Michael Chiklis. So uh, if you haven't been to one of these before, spoken word can mean a lot of different things. We've got storytellers, poets, 
uh, people doing you know, real writing. That's right, I said it. Uh, that sort of thing. So it can be anything. But one thing it always has in common is dick jokes. Uh, but, in, <laughs> but the other thing it, just, it has in common is just you know, getting up on stage in front of people and getting an idea across in whatever vector you have. Um, which uh, has nothing at all to do with the Humane Society. Uh, if you liked that. Segue. You'd like that? That was awesome. It was about as successful as the actual segues. Um, so uh, here's the thing about the Humane Society. Um, you know, it's, it's a, you know, there's different Humane Societies all over the place, but Omaha has a really good one. I don't know if you guys have been out to their, uh, it's the 90th and Ford, I think. Uh, Seriously, it's better than a pet store, it's cheaper than a pet store, and uh, there's really, really cool animals there. I think most of my dogs have been shelter dogs. Uh, Preach. So basically, yeah, dig deep if, or, or don't dig that deep if you, you know, if you got bills, then dig just a little ways in and, you know, bring something out, give them a penny, give them a dollar, whatever. Um, but do what you can. Uh, so I don't know if you guys have met him yet, but we're going to bring up someone here, someone uh, named Dave Nesbitt. Uh, he's going to be kind of new to the stage here, I know, but uh, try to make him feel welcome, Dave Nesbitt. Yeah. Nice to see you too, and hopefully only in that pleasant sort of way. Excuse me while I do the usual thing of clearing things out of the way. I figured that I reached a point where somebody's like, well, we're going to demonstrate that we don't like Dave very much. I want to give you as clear a shot as possible. <laughs> that way when I actually block whatever it is that you throw, it really looks cool. That, and if I end up damaging her mic, she's going to get even with me. Yeah. Although, I want to, we, we are, have been considering something at the Samurai School of Word, and that is that we're considering the idea of doing our own merchandise. T-shirts, something, things like that. And one G strings! G strings! Oh! And a family will actually autograph them. Oh! Um, other things. <laughs> and we had a couple of ideas. One of those, oh. the, the, I, I actually think there might be a great market for you in the pre worn variety. I mean, you know. Go to <laughs> But, it, but keep in mind that if it's actually underneath your clothing, you're not breaking the 25% leopard print rule. <laughs> anyway, we've been considering two different ideas for t-shirts, actually multiple ones, but we're kind of nailing it down. And the first one is basically, and you will all come to know this, that is that they came, they saw, they wouldn't shut up, would be one of them. <laughs> and the other one which really suits me, and especially these next couple of things I'm going to tell you is, uh, poor decision making makes for great stories. And for those of you who know me, I, I can't even begin to spell out the level of truth in that. And I will start with something uh, that kind of sums up a poor, an amazing level of decision making relatively early on in my career. Uh, this is pre-Berlin, for those of you who know that story. <laughs> So if I'm making poor decisions on a level that would be story worthy prior to that one, we're on to something here. Um, it all begins in a wonderful city, Toronto, Canada. I was spending time working for my grandfather, basically handling some of like the, the office end of the business at that point in time. And I was seeing a nice young lady and things were really good. And it's like the first time you're having that really cool teenage relationship, you fall into it, and you're so involved with the hormones, and the first time that you've got that feeling of closeness to someone, and then somewhere about two months into this relationship, her ex-boyfriend laid a couple of black eyes on her, because she was seeing me. And I'm 43 now, and I wouldn't take that particularly well. At 16, you just stop thinking at that moment. And so I'm walking down the street, and I see him. And before I know it, I pounce. I am pounding on this guy, just pounding the crap out of him, and just laying into him. I forgot a couple of key elements that come with the idea that if you're going to be beating the crap out of somebody, first of all, maybe you shouldn't be doing it on a crowded city street at noon in Toronto. And Canadians are about every bit as polite as you can imagine. But there's another key element that will come up in a moment. Um, but what happened was, I'm sitting there, I'm pounding on this guy, and I feel somebody grab my shoulder, and I turn. 
And I'm thinking, it's got to be a buddy of his. As I'm turning, I'm already throwing the punch, and I'm three quarters through it. And that's when I see the blue hat and the blue uniform shirt and the pants and the belt. And I went, oh shit, I'm swinging at a cop. And this is another key element for those of you, uh, should you be in Canada. If you want to sort out a gunfight, pick an American cop. If you want to short out, sort out a fist fight, get a Canadian cop. These guys get swung on all the time. So my really big haymaker didn't even remotely impress him. All I know is the next thing I know, something, I'm pretty sure it was the nightstick, hit me square in the stomach and I went right to the ground. And then somebody else grabs me and I turn and now I'm in fight or flight mode. And I turn and I throw at him and I realize he's wearing a Mounties uniform. <laughs> Which is not going from bad to worse, that's more like going from out of the frying pan into Hiroshima. <laughs> This is a pretty key element. The thing you have to understand about Mounties is it's kind of like swinging on a Texas Ranger, except they're more dangerous. And I, I will, a Texas Ranger will tell you this because they don't have to deal with the weather issues. <clears throat> and so the next, the, any story that you have that involves, so when I woke up, <laughs> it didn't go well for you. And in this case, when I woke up, what happened? in jail, <laughs> with 15 different, I would say, uh, saucer-sized bruises from about here to here because they're smart cops. I didn't have any on my arms that were exposed or on my head, but instead pretty much up and down the length and breadth of my body. Yeah, and then the next thing happened, which was my grandfather had to come get me, which was a two-hour drive getting there, which I'm sure he was sitting there wondering what bizarre element of the gene pool managed to infiltrate my family, and how can I get rid of it? And then also working up a decent case of MAD. And when you've been in the military for 30 some odd years, MAD takes on a brand new form, um, usually involving explosives, blades. I'm pretty sure that at least part of the trip of him coming up was him digging the hole. <laughs> And so um, the last thing on earth I really wanted to see was him bailing my happy ass out of the jail. But there he is, and he's not looking thrilled. And then the longest car ride of my life. Two hours with a person who I know has killed more people than there are in the town that he lives in. And he's not talking to me the whole way. And here's where I have to do like a really cool, it's like one of the few impressions I can do, and of course it is of someone you've never met. Um, but my grandfather's voice was absolutely amazing. It is the sort of voice that only comes from a man who spent most of his time shouting over gunfire and explosions while smoking unfiltered cigarettes. So we get home, and he looks at me as we get inside, and I'm thinking, well, he's probably got a plastic drop cloth or something in here as I'm expecting to be killed, and he looks at me and goes, Hell, son, uh, I think one of us got swallowed whole by the dumbass. <laughs> and I was pretty certain he was not talking about me. And for those of you who do not know, the dumbass is this amazing mythological beast that sneaks up on wary, unsuspecting, relatively intelligent people and takes their goddamn brain. <laughs> and apparently, you're allowed one encounter with the dumbass, and if it doesn't go well, the second time, he's just gonna stone cold wipe you out. And so I had to cop to the fact that I had been swallowed whole by the dumbass and say, yes, sir, I did, I'm really sorry, I, I don't know what happened. And he stopped and for like, it felt like forever as he's sitting there staring at me. And finally he said, all right, I'm gonna straighten this out once. You do it again, you're on your own. I said, thank you very much, and then he pretty much put me to work for like the next 48 hours as a way of reminding me that I pretty much owed his ass. Which led to a rather unique moment of meeting up with the two officers who I had taken to swing at and apologizing to them for doing so. It's a very odd moment when you sit there and realize there are two police officers who pretty much just pounded the crap out of you and you're the one who's actually apologizing. <laughs> and then you think, oh wait a minute, because the alternative was nine months in jail. Yeah, okay, I'll go with that. I, I, I freely admit that I have an ego, but I am also balanced out with a fair amount of intelligence. This to be a period of time in jail, apologizing to the cops. Okay, I'll apologize to the police officers. It worked out fairly well. And so I managed to survive my first encounter with the dumbass. And then I had a few like mini encounters with the dumbass. At some point in time, some of you are here for the first time. You'll, it's, if you come to another show, you'll hear a story of an epic trip to Berlin. 
but I pretty much milked that one for all it's worth with most of the people in this audience, so we'll move on to something else. But one of the things about the epic trip to Berlin was hanging around with people who had access to um, what can only be described as massive amounts of drugs, who I never really dealt. I facilitated by being a security person for the people that dealt massive amounts of drugs, which pays very well. But along the way, you can't be around those sorts of things and not try them. And then in the process of trying them, find out that you really, really like some of them. And then discovering that there are interesting and intriguing permutations of if you take X amount of this powder and mix it with this powder, and then you first start by going, oh yeah. And I'm pointing this out because at one point in time, a very good friend of mine said, you've talked about drugs and such in your, in your stuff before, but you've never really talked about the consequences, and today we're talking about the consequences. Because first you start with, and then somebody will give you the bright idea of saying, hey, but you know, if you're doing it like that, you're wasting it. Oh, really? How should I be doing it to not waste it? Well, I have a syringe, and that's where things head south quickly. And I went into that period where I had a Jones for, I don't know, about a year and a half or so. But it was still functional and capable of working. And don't worry, there will be a punchline in here somewhere. But you do realize that you've kind of come to the end of your rope with your Jones when you hit the plunger and instead of feeling the rush, all of a sudden the world begins to gray out and instantly turn black. And then when you wake up, you're going to notice several things. And the second thing that I noticed was I had an airway in. And the third thing I noticed was that I had been catheterized. But the first thing I noticed was why the fuck does my chest hurt so much? Uh, the primary reason being that they basically had to resuscitate me twice. You know, if you're going to go for the overdose, don't go halfway. Make them work to bring you back. <laughs> they appreciate the effort. If you've not met EMTs or trauma doctors, you think I'm kidding, I'm not kidding. And so you have that moment where you wake up and realize, wow, I have just fucked this one up horribly, haven't I? Now might be the time to wrap this whole drug thing up. But the problem is that you have a Jones, and a Jones is a physical addiction. It's where your body basically says, in order to function properly, I need this substance or bad things will happen. Uh, but I just recently had my heart stop. And so the doctors basically said, we're going to give you maintenance doses of this stuff so that way you don't fall into convulsions while you're still recovering from what was effectively a heart attack. And that's a very interesting situation as you're sitting there leaning on the button trying to get more, but it's kind of metered out. It's very, they, they're very scientific about that sort of thing. And then you get to go to the next fun part of the process, which is detoxing. And when I wrote this story, it was basically the idea of death, detoxing, and then resurrection. So we're now in the mid part of this one. And detoxing, okay, um, I should point out that I've done, I had done my research on alternative cultures and drug cultures and things like that. I had read William Burroughs, I'd seen interviews with Keith Richards. I kind of understood some of these ideas of what these things can do, and specifically what happens when you stop. I have to admit that Keith Richards fucking nailed it. He said, actually, cold turkey really isn't that bad. Basically, it's three days of your body rejecting everything inside of it, full of hallucinations, and then the feeling of glass bugs crawling underneath your skin. And then on the third day, you start to feel better. <laughs> yeah, that was about right. It wasn't quite train spotting levels of intense, but it was pretty much in that league. And I also took part in an interesting medical study. Some of you, I don't know, might be familiar. There's some people who might know that it's a substance called ibogaine. Uh, ibogaine is a fairly intense hallucinogenic. It also has a very interesting side effect when you take it, and that is that it basically helps to dull the receptors that deal with addiction. And at that point in time, the people in the hospital were like, we're gonna try a study with ibogaine, and there were two different control groups. And I discovered later that if you take ibogaine prior to detoxing, you don't actually go through any of the detoxing symptoms. I was in the other group. That was not the <laughs> the fun part of the I, I, if I could have known, I would have sorted that one out. So immediately after like you know seven days of detoxing, washing all this stuff out of my system, breaking my body down, and all of this, they say, oh, and by the way, here, take this, take this pill, and the next thing I know, I'm off flowers. Hey, cool. <laughs> Why did you give me this? And then about 20 hours later, I came back down and went, oh, I don't really feel like I have any desire for this anymore. It's very odd. 
It is kind of clockwork orange that way. To this day, sometimes I think about, I really want to get high, and my brain flashes images of just how much fun detoxing was. I swear to God, it's a reprogramming instrument. <coughs> and then, re-enter my grandfather, who apparently decided that the dumbass had not swallowed meat completely whole this time around. And he decided, knowing how the world works much better than I did, that what I needed to do was disappear for a while, to be away from the possibility of re-entering that world immediately. And the way that he did it was to basically go and take me to his cabin that was about 50 miles outside of Calgary. And if you've ever been to Alberta, go to Calgary, get 10 miles outside of the city, and there is nothing. There are like polar bears, there's no stores, there's no nothing. So basically I spent about the next six months surviving on beans, spam, and beer. This is actually not a half bad diet for your average college age kid. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it now. But back then it wasn't half bad. Occasionally you did have to deal with the fact that there were things like wildlife wandering through your backyard, like say the 600 pound bear as I'm sitting there holding an M1 Garand, which holds eight rounds of 30-06, and I'm looking at the bear going, yeah, that ought to really piss him off. <laughs> Click, okay, big guy, you don't have a problem, I don't have a problem, let's keep it that way. And along the way, I had to physically rebuild myself, and so I had to go out and like walk, because if you've ever, hopefully don't, just allow me to point this out. Um, if you had the opportunity to, I don't know, overdose, or throw your heart into a major attack, and make your heart stop, anything like that, don't do it. Um, because no matter how they make it look on television, it takes a long time for your body to get over that shit. And after about three months, I was able to be able to start walking up this hill. And it kind of became my objective. I, mean, I figured that I would feel like I was at about 100% because the hill was at about this kind of gradient and it had rocks and this and that. And it was a perfect metaphor for me <laughs> wandering and trying to get my health back. And it went on for like a week, and I get like about a quarter of the way up. And after about a month, I'm about half of the way up. And after about a month and a half, I'm like almost there, but I can't quite do it. And after two months, I finally made it to the top of this fucking hill. And I looked out, and there's the majestic ability, the wonderful signs, the wonderful sight that is the uh, Canadian Rockies. Looking out, you can see the city off in the distance. And then I thought, I got two more weeks left here. I'm going to have to go back to the real world. Jesus, now what the fuck am I going to do? Thank you very much, Omaha. It's been great. Dave Nesbitt. So for anybody who's new, that's sort of uh, the type of thing we're going to be doing. Uh, that was actually a lot less profanity than normal, though. Uh, yeah, and we're not necessarily against people bringing people under 18 out here, but they are going to learn some things. So that is, uh, that is something to know about. Now, our next performer is actually leaving us. Uh, he's going, I know, right? He's going to Colorado, where they actually pay writers for things. Uh, he talks about two things on our stage. Horrible, horrible monsters and love. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Travis Hiernan. Thank you, Will. Um, uh, you're going to have to decide when I get into this piece which half of which one of those this fits into. <clears throat> It could be both. Uh, but anyway, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a uh, prime. Oh, what's up? We've lost your head. You're just too tall. Oh, uh, OK. All okay. right. OK. All right. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, a, I'm primarily a fiction writer, but I also do some poetry and uh, um, creative nonfiction. And uh, I've got some uh, books over there. Um, Buy books tonight, and uh, all proceeds go to the Nebraska Humane Society. So, get your message. And actually, uh, just just last night, I was coming home uh, about 10 o'clock, uh, and I walked in my apartment building, and I happened to notice there was a Nebraska Humane Society van parked out front. And I'm like, hmm, animal control sort of situation, maybe I don't know, but. but 
here, as I go in my uh, apartment building, here comes this uh, Humane Society worker, a young woman about I'm 25 or so, carrying a blackbird uh, in her hand um, I, out of my building. I know no more about the story than that, but apparently they say blackbirds as well. So <clears throat> what she did with it, I have no idea. Okay, so anyway, uh, like Will said, this is going to be my last show for a while unless I happen to be back in town and, uh, uh, you know, I get invited to come back. Maybe after I read this, you guys won't want me to <laughs> so, uh, so, I, so, it wasn't until today that I decided what I was going to talk about. And, um, you know, I've, uh, up here I've read some fiction, I've read some creative nonfiction, and Almost all of it involved has involved like relationships that have gone horribly awry or unrequited or a couple of fantasy stories that I've written. Um, and in this case, um, so it came to me this morning. I, I, I needed an idea that would just sort of built up my ire to just get rolling, right? So politics and religion. How about that? Controversial <laughs> there. Um, so, for about the last eight or nine months, I have found myself getting more and more political because there are just so many things that are really, really pissing me off. Um, and, you know, rather than talking about the erosion of the middle class or tax fairness or endless wars, um, most of the last six months of political discourse in this country, at least to me, seem to have been. Um, Santorum-fueled misogyny, um, Romney-inspired cluelessness, uh, Gingrich-style meanness, um, and Limbaugh-handy Coulter-esque douchebaggery. You know, faggots and sluts, right? That's what we're talking about. So th this piece is called uh, Creating Religious Bigots in Four Easy Steps. <laughs> Or how to indoctrinate your child into the cult of your choice. Uh, here's a quote from Richard Dawkins. There are no Christian children, only children with Christian parents. Uh, step one, raise them in an area with no social diversity. You would have to go a long way to get more isolated than my childhood. We're talking New Mexico or West Texas desert. Amazon rainforest, Antarctica, right? Um, the neighbor in Nebraska of my childhood was a town with 110 people, three churches and two bars. Um, and on weekends, there were three bars, if you count the VFW. Uh, there were also two filling stations, a feed store, a hardware store, and nowadays much of that is gone. Um, the closest thing we had to ethnic diversity back then was the local Sioux population. Uh, as neighbors situated near a reservation, drowning in poverty. Uh, so mostly, uh, my exposure to other ethnic groups were mostly referred to prairie niggers, drunks, and squaws. So, you know, this is western Nebraska, right? Or South Dakota, as the case may be. I was also really uh, close to South Dakota. Now, my family was traditionally wisconsin Synod Lutherans. Yes, even within different denominations, there are subsets. My grandparents were staunchly Lutheran, which also meant anti-Catholic, uh, and, and only barely tolerant of other Protestant denominations. Non-Christian religions represented some weird inhuman superstition that included things like human sacrifice or cannibalism. Uh, you know, eating sacred human flesh and drinking blood, that sort of thing. <laughs> you know, there are also these weird holiday names like Saturnalia or Yule, um, which, if you don't know, that's where Christmas came from. Um, one might imagine that as a child I had asked my parents questions like, Dad, what does it mean when you want to Jew someone down? What's a buddhist? Why aren't we supposed to like Catholics? My family was never of that Bible-thumping breed, the proselytizing and preaching. They were very quiet in their discrimination. Um, 
So a tiny community of mostly white Protestants where the closest city with a six-figure population was over four hours away. I had experiences with diversity similar to some Fijian cannibal tribes. <laughs> when I was in the sixth grade on a field trip to the big city, uh, metropolitan Norfolk, or Fork, <laughs> I saw my first real live black person. <laughs> Um, okay, so here's your tip. Here's your tip for step one. Exposing your child to other cultures, other ways of doing things, is extremely detrimental to making your child believe that your way is the only true game in town. You want your child to grow up just like you, right? You want them to have correct values and good morals. You certainly don't want them to be gay or have them fall in love with someone who's the wrong skin color, um, or, marry, or whose religion is too far afield from yours. Methodists might be okay, but don't you dare try to marry a Catholic. <laughs> if they try to bring home some bisexual, dark-skinned Zoroastrian with dreadlocks and a beauty, <laughs> make sure you punish them properly by making them family and community outcasts, or else disown them immediately. Step two. Raise them in an area with institutions of higher edu with no in institutions of higher education within 150 miles. When I was in high school, I attended a number of church functions since I was an active youth group member. I remember feeling this sense of obligation to participate. One of the events I attended was the screening of a video that discussed the new science of how dinosaurs and man had coexisted, how evolution did not exist. One of the schisms between the Wisconsin Synod and the Missouri Synod, uh, Lutheran sects, is over creationism. The Wisconsin Synod clings to young earth creationism, the belief that the universe is about six or 7,000 years old, that the book of Genesis, complete with seven-day creation story, Noah's Ark, etc., is literal truth. While the Missouri Synod is marginally less medievalistic and <laughs> believes in uh, theistic evolution, uh, nowadays known as intelligent design. A few months ago, I attended my aunt and uncle's 50th wedding anniversary. My aunt's brother has been a Lutheran minister for going on 30 years. He asked me that afternoon if I was still going to church. It's his job to ask such questions, to keep everybody in the flock. I gave him a friendly but emphatic no. <laughs> When he asked why, I explained to him that I could not reconcile, reconcile the real, proven, factual science that I had had to learn as part of my bachelor's degree in engineering um, with the things that I had been taught in Sunday school. His response was, then it sounds like you need less science class. <laughs> you can't make this up. And that sums up a lot of reasons why I'm up here talking about this. I said, I guess religion and education just don't mix. Uh, at that, his wife, who was standing nearby, was visibly offended. So if you want your child to adhere to your religious beliefs, make sure that they lack critical thinking skills or any desire to question. I know our current elementary and secondary education systems already do this. Uh, but you have to make sure that there is no one around who actively questions the things the child is being taught. See, the, thing, the good thing about kids is that they're trusting. Make sure that you tell them science is mostly lies and those people don't know what they're talking about anyway and that the only logic that they need to follow is that the Bible is the word of God and is thus infallible and if it ain't in the Bible, it's irrelevant especially the passage in, passages in Leviticus that talk about what marriage should look like, what we should do with rape victims and horrors and how many wives it's okay to have. Uh, this statement should be generalized to include all holy books, unless they were written by God's finger in great big letters across the surface of the moon. <laughs> then, then again, we have lasers now that can do just about that. Make sure you put them in a school where Darwin's discovery of scientifically proven, repeatable, understood now at the genetic level process of evolution is still just a theory. 
After all, if you can't personally fathom how eyes evolved, or how chimpanzees and homo sapiens sapiens evolved from the same common ancestor, it couldn't possibly be true, right? Much, under, much understanding how gravity, much less understanding how gravity makes Earth circle the sun. That's just a theory too, right? Step three, teach them through classes and community practices that everybody else is wrong and thus going to hell. <laughs> just like all cults, isolation is the key. Everyone else is lying to you. It's a phrase that cult leaders use to great effect. Here's the difference between a religion and a cult. In a cult, somebody at the top knows it's a scam. In a religion, that person is dead. <laughs> You might think cults are made up, religions aren't. Oh yeah? In the 1950s, a science fiction writer was hanging out <laughs> with, some of his, yeah, yeah, with some of his science fiction writer buddies, and he declared, perhaps on a bet, that he was going to start a religion. His buddies laughed at him, and he said, fuck you, watch me. <laughs> and in case you don't know, his name was L. Ron Hubbard, and now we have Scientology. <laughs> uh, Joseph Smith had some visions, got people to believe him, and now we have Mormonism. Muhammad had some visions, got people to believe him, and now we have Islam. Moses had some visions, came back down the mountain, and in a great two-for-one sale, now we have Judaism and Christianity. Need I go on? Okay, step four. Teach them through frequent, carefully organized classes that the Bible, or whatever your holy book is, is absolute literal truth, the inspired word of God, and even though it was written several thousand years ago by pastoral desert people, and later thoroughly edited and cherry-picked by the, by the early Catholic Church, even though every story in, in it, from Genesis to Moses to Jesus, was liberally adapted or stolen from earlier Sumerian, Babylonian, or Egyptian mythology. <laughs> when you hear something enough times, you believe it. All that memorization of all that memorization of Bible verses and recitation of the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, does have the intended effect. If you say something frequently enough, with other people saying the same thing, you cannot help but start to believe it. I spent my junior high years going to catechism every Wednesday night for two hours, where my classmates and I were forced to memorize huge chunks of not only Bible verse, but also great swaths of text that Martin Luther wrote back in the 15th century. I couldn't help but be indoctrinated myself, but I was the only kid asking hard questions. Contraception, evolution, women's rights, I still remember these topics of discussion, um, and I never got satisfactory answers. So I like to think I was thinking for myself back then, but over the next decade or so, I still said some things I wish I could reach back and slap myself for. Ridiculously homophobic, racist, small-minded shit. Um, and every one of those instances can be tied directly back to religious doctrines. What I didn't know back then was that the story of Moses, well here, let me, let me, let me back up for a second. Um, I'm gonna go off script for 30 seconds. Um, okay, so you, you guys, maybe you've heard this story. Mother uh, is worried about the safety of her baby, her infant son. She puts him in a basket, puts him on the river. He goes down the river. He is found by the court of a king where he is raised, becomes a great uh, advisor and confidant to the king, but eventually becomes king himself. Who am I talking about? Hmm? Isis. Hmm? Isis. Isis? Okay, that's one. What's it? Willow. <laughs> uh, Willow? Okay. What's the Bible version? Moses. Moses. Okay, yes. Well, that was, that was a story of Gilgamesh. Okay? And... And that story is about 2,000 years older than the Hebrews, okay? Um, okay, so we have another story. Um, guy is born of a virgin, uh, is uh, sacrificed, and a few days later comes back from the dead. 
Horus. This, in this case, I was talking about Horus, the Egyptian god. Okay? So my point is that all of these Middle Eastern religions fed on each other, right? They were stealing stories from each other right and left, just like the Catholic church, church stole pagan holidays, okay? And how much uh, angst and hatred and bigotry are coming along nowadays, especially in the last six, even in the last six months, over this stuff that doesn't matter, that who knows what the real origins of it were. So, coming out of college about 20 years ago, when I was just uh, emerging from my indoctrinated ignorance, I read a book called Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Um, if you've read or seen The Da Vinci Code, you know the contents, right? Since Dan Brown directly borrowed much of the plot from his story, from this really meticulously researched book. I didn't necessarily believe everything the authors posited, but the book did drive home one point for me, irresistibly, irretrievably, inexorably. The sheer weight of cultural practices we hold to every day as religion, or Christianity as the case may be, have no basis in any holy book. They were incorporated because they were expedient, or politically correct, or at the time, or they furthered the church's immediate designs. It doesn't take much reading to see the possibility that the Bible, and therefore Judaism, Christianity, and by extension Islam, are an enormous construct with a history so complex, so fraught with political tensions and ethnic strife, shady backroom deals and greed that it just boggles the mind. So therefore, if you really want your child to hold to your chosen religion, make absolutely sure they are taught not to ask questions. Your chosen holy book is, after all, its only closed logical loop. Why? Because the Bible tells us so. Because the Bible is the word of God. Therefore, the Bible is infallible. Can you, you can't argue with that now, can you? Now, I'm going to string together a few quotes by a journalist, author, and atheist, Christopher Hitchens, before I wrap up. I'm not an atheist myself. Um, I, what we know about quantum mechanics sort of boggles the mind. And, really makes you think about what consciousness is. And uh, so I'm leaving that door open, but he is absolutely merciless when it comes to organized religion. The consensus among scientists is that Homo sapiens has been on Earth for at least 100,000 years. We know this from geology, paleontology, carbon dating, so on and so forth. We know this stuff, it's proven. To be a Christian, you have to believe that for 98,000 years, our species suffered and died, most of its children dying in childbirth, most other people having a life expectancy of about 25, dying of their teeth, of famine, of struggle, vicious war, suffering, suffering misery, all of that for 98,000 years. Heaven watches it with complete indifference. And then, 2,000 years ago, he thinks, that's enough of that, it's time, it's time to intervene. The best way to do this would be condemning someone to, you, to human sacrifice uh, from somewhere in the less literate parts of the Middle East. Not, um, let's appeal to the Chinese, for example, where people can read and where they can study evidence and have a civilization. Let's go to the desert and have another revelation. This is nonsense. It cannot be believed by a thinking person. If it was true, I would have two for, it would have two further implications. It would mean that the designer of this plan is unbelievably lazy and inept, or unbelievably callous, and cruel, and indifferent, and capricious. All of this could be part of a plan. There is no way an atheist can prove it's not. But it's some plan, isn't it? It's some plan, isn't it? With mass destruction, pitiless extermination, annihilation going on all the time, and all of this set in motion on a scale that is absolutely beyond our imagination in order that the Pope can tell people not to jerk off. <laughs> it took me a few years to unlearn all this bullshit, and it was awkward at times, painful at others, with numerous conversations with my parents and grandparents about why I wasn't going to church, about why I didn't care that my girlfriend didn't go to church, about standing with my cousin who <gasps> intended to marry a Catholic. <gasps> Now, I should make it clear that I bear my family no ill will over any of this. None of this was some sort of nefarious plot by my parents. 
Just like a fish pays no attention to the water it swims through. Just like we, all of us, swim through invisible, un usually unnoticed air, air that nevertheless sustains us, we swim through our culture and pay little attention. My parents swam through that small town Lutheran family culture that no one really gave a second thought to. This was just how things were. Religion was not about an earnest quest for the divine. It was about family ties, expectations, and raising their kids the way they thought was right. And that's the trap. And I'm going to finish up with a poem that I wrote about a week ago. I went to the uh, uh, poetry slam and had a like hammer shot to the forehead of inspiration. I quick had to write this while some other poet was up there performing. This is called I Cry Out. I cry out in the temple of Inanna and no one answers. I cry out in the temple of Apollo and no one answers. I cry out in the temple of Isis and no one answers. I cry out in the synagogue and no one answers. I cry out in the cathedral and no one answers. I cry out in the mosque and no one answers. I cry out on the pyramid of Quetzalcoatl and no one answers but the high priest with his sacrificial dagger. I cry out at the tent revival, and no one answers but the man with the donation plate. I cry out under every vaulted ceiling, under every golden, wooden, silver, plaster, plastic icon, and nothing answers but dogma, and division, and control, and delusion, and lies, and judgment, and willful ignorance. And finally, when my cries have died and my tears have dried, a tiny voice, mine. Thank you very much. All right, so all of that sounded accurate except for the Scientology stuff. And I just want to say it sounds like you have a niacin imbalance and you got too many thetans and you need some auditing. That's all I'm going to say. I don't want to judge or anything. I'm not level nine, you know, I, but uh, I just. <laughs> now, if you haven't heard Megan McGuire before, uh, it's because she hasn't gone up that many times. Um, but the time she did go up, she absolutely killed it. Uh, so I'm not even going to do a lot of segues or anything. I'm just going to introduce Megan McGuire, and then I'm going to go sit down and enjoy. Because uh, she's really awesome, and that's as far as I'm going to go with it, Megan McGuire. <laughs> It's nice to be introduced as awesome, but now I gotta be awesome. No pressure. No, not at all. That's tough. I think we're all strangely on the same wavelength tonight. I, I'm not gonna do the same kind of preaching, but I, I do want to talk about somebody that we lost recently in March. We lost an important voice. The poet Adrian Rich was fiercely gifted. She was one of the most award-winning poets of our age. She was a feminist before it was an ism. She wrote socially conscious verse that influenced a generation, those who fought for women's rights, GLBT rights, and pacifists. She was called one of the most influential poets of the latter 20th century. By writing of her own struggle and turmoil as a young mother, trying to fit into the role that society assigned to her, she brought the impression of women and later lesbians to the forefront of poetic discourse. She refused the National Medal of Arts in 1997 in protest of the government at that time trying to cut funding for the National Endowment for the Arts. <coughs> she said, excuse me, I'm concerned about what it means when we have two parties which are so close together in their collaboration with the wealthiest interests in the country and I feel as if the relative creative freedom of the artists and intellectuals that we know ultimately depends on the conditions everywhere, the conditions of human labor everywhere. We're all working, we're all trying to do our work, and the circumstances, the conditions under which working people exist in society are not something that can be separated from working artists or the position of the artist. I thought it appropriate to read a few of her poems here tonight to celebrate her life and struggles. 
and the true beauty of her words, so I hope you'll bear with me. This is Wait by Adrian Rich. In paradise, every the desert wind is rising. Third thought, in hell there are no thoughts, is of earth. Sand screams against your government issued tent. Hell's noise in your nostrils crawl into your ear shell. Wrap yourself in no thought. Wait. No place for the little lyric. Wedding ring glint, the reason why on earth they never told you. November 1968, 1968. Stripped, you're beginning to float free. Up through the smoke of brush fires and incinerators, the unleaved branches won't hold you, nor the radar aerials. You're what the autumn knew would happen. After the last collapse of primary color, once the last absolutes were torn to pieces, you could begin. How you broke open, what sheathed you. Until this moment, I knew nothing about it. My ignorance of you amazes me. Now that I watch you starting to give yourself away to the wind. This is one of my favorites. Power. By the way, these are all Adrian Rich. <laughs> Living. Uh, Adrian Rich. One of, one of the most decorated poets of the latter half of the 20th century. Power. <clears throat> Living in the earth deposits of our history, today a backhoe divulged out of a crumbling flank of earth. One bottle, amber, perfect, hundred years old. Cure for fever or a melancholy, a tonic, for living on this earth in the winters of this climate. Today, I was reading about Marie Curie. She must have known she suffered from radiation sickness, her body bombarded for years by the element she had purified. It seems she denied to the end the source of the cataracts on her eyes, the cracked and separating skin of her finger ends, till she could no longer hold a test tube or a pencil. She died, a famous woman denying her wounds. Denying her wounds came from the same source as her power. Prospective immigrants, please note, Adrian Murray. Either you will go through this door, or you will not go through. If you go through, there is always the risk of remembering your name. Things look at you doubly, and you must look back, and let them happen. If you do not go through, it is possible to live worthily, and maintain your attitudes, to hold your position, to die bravely. But much will blind you. At what cost? Who knows? The door itself makes no promises. It is only a door. The last one from Adrian Rich. What kind of times are these? There's a place between two stands of trees where the grass grows uphill. And the old revolutionary road breaks off in shadows. Near a meeting house abandoned by the persecuted who disappeared into those shadows. I've walked there, picking mushrooms at the edge of dread, but don't be fooled. This isn't a Russian poem. This is not somewhere else but here. Our country moving closer to its own truth and dread, its own ways of making people disappear. I won't tell you where the place is, the dark mesh of woods meeting the unmarked strip of light, ghost-ridden crossroads, leaf-mold paradise. 
I know already who wants to buy it, sell it, make it disappear. And I won't tell you where it is. So why do I tell you anything? Because you still listen. Because in times like these, to have you listen at all, it's necessary to talk about trees. So I'm not nearly conceited enough to, to follow that with my stuff and have anybody think that I'm in the same category. So I kind of feel like we're moving from the sacred to the profane here. <laughs> well, I'm not that mission, so. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but I did want to read a few of my own pieces. I think um, it sounds like there are a lot of people who are kind of in the same state of mind. There's this vibration of frustration that seems to be in the air. And it doesn't matter what you believe or what side you're on, uh, whose side you take, how you're going to vote, it doesn't matter. It, everybody's frustrated. Everybody's having a difficult time trying to see through the fog, trying to figure out what they should do, trying to figure out what they should think, if they should be thinking anything at all. A lot of people putting their heads down. And for them, I wrote this poem, Apolitical. If we continue down this path, make the mistakes we threaten, too, we're doomed. You heard me. This is the slippery slope, the road to hell. Disaster. How can we teach this, leave this to our children? We owe it to them, to ourselves, to stop this heresy, this injustice cannot stand cannot stand our rights, our lies, our way of life is at stake. Is this what you want? Are you angry yet? Who are these clowns, these idiots who think they can take what is ours? We must defend ourselves. Do you hear me? We must defend our biggest fears will be realized they are greedy. Realized they are corrupt. Realized they are unnatural, unreal, unlike us. Don't wait. Don't stop. March, fight, protest. Pick up the phone and give. Vote. Vote for the person you want voting for you. Don't let them ruin the world. Watch out for those who claim to speak the truth. Just one more thing to decide. Who the hell are they? <laughs> During a thunderstorm, your lips a breath, fierce, swelling gale, your body a deepening rumble, our sweat pouring down, pouring down, pouring on the glass, the glass, the fragile glass of the window. The pains between us are not gone, not forgotten, just pushed aside for the moment. Our trees, limbs, sway, entangled, too far, buffeting, murmuring. Your forehead sky is fearsome, roiled with clouds. Here and gone and gone, I can't touch, yes, touch astounding, yes, touch electric, our hearts a frantic bird caught. Flying back to the tree, into and through the night, struggling desperate flight, unceasing higher, nearly and ah, the bolt white, the bolt hot, illuminates at last every bedraggled feather silhouette against the rain dark sky. <laughs> Thank you guys for putting up with this. I got one more for you. <laughs> Curse. We're all thinking the same way. When did fuck become a curse? <laughs> no mind, but when did body, ripe and real, become bad, death, evil? Who decided this? Can I not decide? 
I suppose we use the words we know like old blankets too faded, sure, to be softer at the edges. So long we've come so far to realize we are beautiful enough. Why do we teach ourselves to hate ourselves? So what to use if body, sex, is wholly profound, wholly possessed, or dirt, or earth, or darkness, sacred? Surely we can see with better, hotter fire, use words with teeth, with truth, for cursing. But who wants to hear the truth? Better to shun, perhaps, than to curse with cancer, arson, AIDS. Slavery, starvation, corruption, credit default swaps. <laughs> <laughs> when did fuck become a curse? When we decided that it was better to hate ourselves than force ourselves to face reality. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Megan McGuire. So we're going to take a 10 minute break here and then we'll be back for more. Uh, if you're not enjoying it so far, there's a bar right over there. So get hammered, smoke cigarettes, black tar heroin, whatever it is you got to do, you got 10 minutes to do it. So uh, intermission.